Dennis. Hi. Uh, good discussion. Always uh, good to have different views hashed out uh, rather than monologues. So I appreciate that. Um, and Aaron's particularly good at laying the kindling, so I appreciate that too. Uh, first on legislation, uh, I think people should remember that the last time we had major bipartisan financial regulation was in the 1990s. 1998, Glass-Steagall was taken down, and in 2000, the CFMA was passed. And seven Modern years... Future Modernization Act. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so those two major pieces of deregulation... Um, pretty directly contributed to the 2008 crash, which is catastrophic to tens of millions of Americans. So when people talk about how great bipartisan legislation is, they might want to have some humility. Um, I wanted to uh, ask you to think about something. Let's assume it's October of 2021, weeks from Bitcoin's peak, right? Um, and the so-called regulation that you're asking for was in place, which is to say we have deep interconnection between the crypto markets and the banking system. We have multiple crypto activities within the banking perimeter. And then over the next six months, two thirds of the value of crypto disappears. It doesn't disappear, right? It's actual losses. So you get $2 trillion. And I know some debate about the actual value in the dollar uh, equivalent stuff, but let's just for this thought piece say it's two trillion out of three trillion disappears. So you're now at a circumstance where it's within the, the banking perimeter, right? It's on the bank's balance sheets, and you are now therefore looking at massive banking regulator intervention, taxpayer bailouts potentially and significant other um, consequences as a result of the interconnections that you're advocating for and within the bank and pulling it all within the banking perimeter are we better off having had banks potentially collapse in the last six months or less because of the collapse of the price because it's on their balance sheets and remember it's not just on their balance sheets they're going to create derivatives off of them and the derivatives are going to be the conveyor belt to spread risk throughout the entire global system. The so here, we, where are we if we're actually now backstopping that industry and that industry is now on the balance sheet? Are we better off or worse off? <laughs> so I think your question is really important in that it makes me rethink kind of how I was framing you know, what, what do we mean by banks engaging in the digital asset market, right? Are we talking about prudential regulation for Bitcoin and Ethereum? No, right? I think that's more in the land of the market regulators. Um, when we're talking about prudential regulation, I probably should be more specific to talking about these the stablecoin markets, these deposit-like products um, or potential payment use case products down the road. Um, so I don't know, you know, given the prudential regulation and the framework that we've been discussing here, October 2021, that, that we would have had such interconnectedness, you know, that, that highly speculative um, activity in the, you know, traditional crypto space, that 21,000 coins that the acting Chair Gruenberg referenced, um, I, I'm not sure that would be on banks' balance sheets. Um, yeah. So if it had regulation that restricted the reserves of stablecoin holdings back, you know, a year ago, we wouldn't have had the Terra Luna collapse that caused many people's savings, right? Uh, because those are strictly, you know, they're not reserved by high quality liquid asset of level one quality, right? That's a very clear restriction that one could put in place to safeguard uh, at least some part of the financial system and to safeguard consumer protection as well? Well, obviously, we'd be much worse. <laughs> um, and to, to Gordon's point, I mean, Terra Luna absolutely would have happened. I mean, one, that was an algorithmic stable coin that was based overseas. So US regulation would have made a lick of difference. And, you know, it collapsed. Obviously, it spilled into the, um, the rest of the crypto ecosystem, which is incredibly interconnected. All these assets are tightly correlated. You know, brought down Three Arrows Capital, it brought down Voyager, it brought down Celsius, and thank God it didn't spill into the traditional financial system. And so that should be something that, you know, frankly, from a policy standpoint, you know, we got right. I mean, that's a bit of a win. Um, and, you know, you look at the FSOC report it, in the FSB report that came out um, a week later, you know, it said that right now the interconnections between the traditional financial system and crypto are, are minimal. 
And I think policymakers should do everything within their power to um, to keep it that way. Because, you know, once you sort of do one thing, then it triggers this chain reaction. Go back to 2017. The CFTC authorizes Bitcoin futures. All right. Then the SEC really is kind of forced at that point to allow uh, an ETF tracking Bitcoin futures. They've continued to, rightfully in my opinion, uh, not approve a ETF tracking spot Bitcoin. But now they're being, you know, challenged in court. And the basis for that challenge is, well, you allowed an ETF on Bitcoin futures, right? So what one agency does spills over into other agencies. And so I was glad that, you know, Chair Greenberg said that he's working with, with all the agencies. And I encourage them to continue to do so and do what they can to keep crypto out of the traditional financial system. So, so could I, I'm going to go back to one point. I, I completely disagree with you. The U.S. needs to take a leading role in setting the regulatory standards. If the U.S. had set regulatory standards are highly upheld, then also not offering the same shelf space for different type of stable coins to be listed, even if some of them are not fully back, we probably could have prevented quite a bit of the loss that Terra and Luna have caused. So I'm going to use this opportunity to thank the panelists and, and draw the event to close with, it, with, with one observation which is that uh, 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 from, from prior research, I have a piece coming out in the Yale Journal of Financial Stability shortly. It says that all financial crises are predicated on two different things, the fundamental mispricing of an asset and leverage. And the, what that asset is can vary, right? It can be a securitization backed by subprime mortgages. It can be the price of tulips in a Dutch market. Right. And we've seen throughout human history, uh, you can have the fundamental mispricing of an asset without a financial crisis. What is a click worth on the website? In the 1990s, this was a new thing and we didn't really know. And some folks made a lot of fortunes were made and fortunes were lost, as Chairman Grunberg uh, uh, used that terminology. Uh, as the value of Netscape and Pets.com and this online uh, bookseller named Amazon skyrocketed and then collapsed. I think Amazon went from about zero to over 100 and then went down to nine. At one point, if you were down 90% in Amazon and then today it's exploded. At various points, if you were deep in Pets.com or Netscape or you know some of the, the, the dot-com other things, you were gone. We didn't know how to fundamentally value a click. Now we have a pretty good idea, right? For better or, or, or worse. Um, you know, there wasn't leverage in the dot-com bubble in large part because of strong margin requirements on retail investors that were not taken away during the re deregulatory frenzy. Um, and, you know, the idea of, of mispricing assets ought not to scare us so much and it ought not to be so scary when assets fall in value. There seems to be a subtext that when assets go up in value, that's good for society. And when assets go down in value, we have to stop that. And I, 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 I constantly wonder, maybe we should be a little more comfortable and somewhat ironically, particularly among some of my conservative friends in letting asset values go up and down, provided that we have the right safeguards and leverage and not react so quick to open the public till when assets go down, except for extremely a priori, highly regulated and clearly communicated assets like bank deposit insurances, which is provided on a limited basis to individuals for, for distinct purposes.